And I'm very grateful to uh, Jessica Allen, friend to the festival, um, who is the deputy director of IHE and is going to talk to us today about the fabulous work that she's been doing, not just here in Greater Manchester, um, but also nationally and globally. Jessica, over to you and thank you so much for uh, coming to speak at the festival. Thank you very much, a pleasure to be here. Um, I remember fondly the, the festival in person in Manchester, but we were just remarking that it's great that so many people from all over the world can now participate, even though we have to navigate Zoom. So, uh, yes, I'm the Deputy Director at the Institute of Health Equity, which is based at UCL and is Michael Marmot's unit uh, there. We established in 2010, following the first English Review of Health Inequalities, which we did, uh, known as the Marmot Review. Um, so today um, I'll be talking about some work which we've done over the past 15 months. Um, but before I do that, I'm just going to start back at the beginning, which was the 2008 Commission on the Social Determinants of Health, which Michael Marmot chaired, and the Global Commission on Social Determinants of Health, which really set the agenda and provided a very strong evidence base about the role of social determinants of health um, and covered, of course, the whole world, applicable low, middle and high income countries. And since then, we've globally, we've really seen a lot of interest and focus and it's kind of gone through various cycles. Um, and at the moment, um, there's a huge interest in globally in the social determinants of health, um, partly as a result of um, the building evidence base and partly as a result of the pandemic, of course, because I think globally, the pandemic is exposing as well as exacerbating inequalities um, in socioeconomic factors, which are driving inequalities in health and inequalities in exposure to the pandemic. So this is an important moment we feel for social determinants of health movement. Um, and certainly we've been exceptionally busy responding to requests from all over the world. Um, the work I'm gonna talk about today is work we've done in England over the past months, but globally also I'd like to flag up that we've um, undertaken a major commission for the, the Mediterranean region of WHO, which is covers North Africa, uh, Middle East, parts of Central Asia. So um, it's, it's been an exceptionally busy and important year, I think, um, and one of the silver linings of the pandemic has been this increased focus on inequality and on the social determinants of health. Um, so following the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health... Oh, yeah. um, Ruth, you orange. I came back late yesterday. I'm in a meeting. I'm in a meeting. Hi, delegates. Are you okay muting yourselves when you come in? Thank you. Um, so, following the Commission on Social Terms of Health, um, we, um, I joined Michael and we undertook the uh, review of health inequalities in England, commissioned by the then Secretary of State for Health under a Labour government and reported in uh, to a coalition government um, a year later. Um, and just as a reminder, really, the, the initial Marmot review, the 2010 Marmot review, showed very clearly the very close association between socioeconomic factors and health outcomes, so life expectancy, healthy life expectancy uh, and a whole range of different health outcomes and these measures of socioeconomic status in England. And in England, we do have very, very good data and we're able to show in foreign detail exactly how close the inequalities in health, uh, how, how close health is to socioeconomic position. We made a series of recommendations about what to do about it. Uh, some of which have been were 
accepted by the government, even though it was a different government that commissioned the initial review. Um, in fact, all but one of our main recommendations um, were accepted by the government. The one which wasn't was the one around income. Um, we recommended a basic income for healthy living, which was higher than the minimum wage um, and it allowed people to live a healthy life, not just a survival life. And um, that was rejected by the government. And since 2010, we've seen large growth in Eng England, a large growth in interest in the social determinants of health approach, but also some questions about how practical um, it could be when many of the levers are with central government. We've seen overall lack of focus and interest from central government and a big interest from local government and from public health. So we've been working with local authorities in England um, to try and support their efforts to embed a social determinants of health approach. And we've been trying, we have been trying up until this is until 2020 to really advocate to the national government in England to take the social determinants of health approaches that we recommend and to reduce inequalities and social and economic factors which are driving poor health. Um, limited success, as I say, I think local government, public health um, and other policy areas have taken the agenda seriously, um, but there's still big focus on healthcare as the solution to poor health, um, so treatment rather than prevention or cure, sorry, prevent cure rather than prevention, and we all know that prevention is better than cure, and um, a lack of awareness really among the public, I think, about how important social economic factors are, living conditions, working conditions, uh, the importance of early childhood and shaping later life health. I think those things are really still less understood by the public, and that's partly um, our responsibility. We haven't been very effective at communicating these messages simply to the public, and that's an enormous challenge and one that we see all over the world. And we, we know that without this kind of public awareness and public interest, that the politicians who hold many of the levers um, are not going to be taking this agenda seriously. So still a big challenge in terms of raising awareness amongst the general public um, about social and economic factors. That said, when you talk to people who have experience of living in poverty and who are subject to exclusion and discrimination, they know that this is affecting their health, but that message isn't getting to politicians and certainly isn't sort of influencing decision makers. So that's a slightly uh, rambling preamble. Um, I have some slides and as I said, we will be um, focusing on the reviews that we've done in England, um, but, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to share my screen. I'll get there. Can you see the slides? We can. They're not on full screen mode, though, if you. Okay. Okay, thank you. So this is, these are about the um, reviews in England um, and that we've done in the last 15 months. Um, so, um, in February last year, in 2020, so just before the pandemic really hit in England, we published um, an analysis of the pre what had happened since we published the initial English review in 2010. So, Health Equity in England, the Marmot Review, 10 years on. And in that, we tried to summarise um, inequalities in health over the preceding 10 years and looked at inequalities in the social determinants of health um, and tried to understand why we'd seen the changes that we had seen. So, life expectancy in England for females and males, and you can see that there have been steady increases in life expectancy in England. Um, and in fact, if you take this data even further back, um, I think we went back as far as about 1900. Uh, clearly, the data is not very robust at that point, but it does show that there had been 
improvements in life expectancy, um, but ups and downs a little bit, um, especially through the wars and in the aftermath, but generally a very clear increase and steady increase in life expectancy, which is what we've come to expect. And then from about 2010, we noticed this marked change. Life expectancy has plateaued. So a really significant shift and a very, very concerning one. Um, when, as we've always said, uh, life expectancy or health outcomes really show how well a society is functioning. If you see stalling life expectancy, as we saw from 2010 onwards, something really significant and damaging is happening in the social determinants of health and in the society. So this was our first very clear message in the analysis, is that something very significant is happening, and very damaging is happening um, related to these stalling life expectancy. Um, and to answer any, any people who thought that maybe we just reached peak life expectancy um, and that we, this was the natural longevity which we could expect, um, there are many countries around the world especially high income Asian countries where life expectancy is considerably higher. Um, remaining and in fact widening inequalities in health since 2010. Um, and you can see here for males and females, the differences in life expectancy related to the area in which you lived. So for those people living in the most deprived areas for both men and women, considerably shorter life expectancy than for those living in the least deprived deciles. Uh, for men, the gap is nine and a half years, and for women, over seven years. And you can see very clear, clearly that social class gradient. So it's not just the poorest who are living in the worst health, it's everybody along that whole social class gradient. So everybody in England, apart from those at the very top, are li living less long than they would if they were at the very top. So these are the very clear and systematic inequalities in health, which we described in the 2010 Marmot Review, and which was still there very clearly um, in 2020. And in fact, as I'll come on show, health inequalities have actually widened. Um, not just life expectancy, of course, very important to think about health um, and healthy life expectancy. Um, and you can see here that for women, marked here in red between, uh, from 2012, healthy life expectancy had actually declined as well. So we're used to seeing increases in healthy life expectancy, but for women post 2011, that actually declined. And the years spent in poor health had increased for both men and women. So again, life expectancy stalling and for some decreasing um, and uh, health also declining. We spent quite a lot of time thinking about uh, regional differences in uh, life expectancy. So for those of you who are familiar with the uh, geography of England, northwest and northeast of England have much worse health, and that's been the position for a long time, lower life expectancy, lower uh, healthy life expectancy. Um, there are very poor areas in London, which also have extremely uh, poor life expectancy, poor health outcomes, and very deprived, high rates of poverty. Um, but overall, regionally, the northwest and northeast um, parts of Yorkshire and Humber have lower life expectancy and worse health. So this was an important figure for us as we came to review what was happening in 2020. And you can see that for the least deprived, the least deprived uh, decile, per between 2010 and 2018, the last point we had data for, that uh, life expectancy had increased slowly, but it had increased most in most of the regions. However, for those in the most deprived decile, you can see a worrying picture, life expectancy was actually declining in every region, except for London, where there had been um, increases. So something very significant happening, um, and you can see the inequalities among regions in the least deprived decile are far higher than they are um, for the least deprived decile. So this is where all the inequality, the regional inequality is really playing out in the most deprived deciles and the lower deciles, bottom 20, 30% as well. Um, and London, something about London, although the very high rates of poverty and high levels of deprivation in many places, um, even the poorest had seen some increases in life expectancy 
and this wasn't the same in other regions. So widening regional inequalities in health, um, a very damaging um, regional inequalities. And this graph similarly showing these regional inequalities in health. Um, the, green, the green lines are for London, the pale green lines are for London, dark green line, lines for the Northeast. And you can see it for the most deprived, the position in 2016-18, the solid bars, differences between London and the Northeast. But you can also see that since 2010 to 12, health has actually declined. Uh, life expectancy has actually declined in the Northeast for those lower deciles. So the solid bar is below the dotted bar. And every point that is, that's showing that life expectancy has actually declined. The reverse is true in London. Health has improved, life expectancy has improved. And again, you can see that the inequalities are not towards the top end. If you're wealthy in the Northeast, you're living almost as long um, and as in good health as you would in London, and the inequality is really further down the socioeconomic uh, gradient um, and getting worse. Um, a reminder of the um, policy objectives that we set out in the 2010 Marmot Review, because these are the ones that we reviewed, we then went on to review in the 2020 10 years on report, give every child the best start in life, enable all children, young people and adults to maximise their capabilities. So these are a set of recommendations around education, training, uh, mental health among young people, uh, severely damaged by the pandemic, I'll come on to that. Um, uh, to have some, to learn resilience, resourcefulness, self-efficacy, to have those kind of conditions which allow people to have control over their lives. And these skills are built um, through education and in early adulthood. Uh, the third set of recommendations about good quality employment, so not just employment, but good quality employment. We know that unemployment is very, very damaging for health, uh, not just because of the poverty that's associated with unemployment, but also because of the loss of status, um, not having a, a rewarding and meaningful um, job to do, very damaging for health, and similarly poor working conditions very damaging for health. And we've seen a growth in poor working conditions over the past 10 years, which has damaged health enormously, as well as low pay. Healthy standard living for all. This is uh, the recommendations I mentioned earlier around income um, and having enough money to live a healthy life, not just to survive, but to have a healthy life um, and to try to minimize the stress and um, of the stress and strain of um, poverty and persistent poverty. Fifth set of recommendations around healthy and sustainable places and communities. That includes housing, transport, clean air, um, having places to meet, uh, safe places to be outside in green and blue spaces, very important for mental and physical health. Um, so a whole set of very important recommendations around places. And then sixthly, uh, the role and impact of ill health prevention, and this was where we talked about um, public health, health behaviours, so alcohol, smoking, obesity, drugs, um, and what the uh, whole government can do um, around that. Now, of course, we see that the social determinants of health are very closely related to those health behaviours. We talk about ill health, uh, we talk about uh, those poor health behaviours as the causes of ill health, but the social determinants of health as the causes of the causes of ill health. So we take it back a step to look at what's driving those big inequalities in smoking, alcohol, poor mental health, um, poor nutrition and obesity that we see. So the factors around poverty and deprivation and stress, which relate so closely to those behaviors. So uh, we wanted to know what was driving the poor health outcomes and the deteriorations in health that we'd seen since 2010, since 2010 and the widening inequalities. Um, and so we looked at, clearly this has been a decade of austerity, um, so significant cuts to government finance, to local government, to public services, to social policies um, and welfare system. Um, which all are related to health. So as expected, we saw that public sector expenditure as a percent of GDP declined, but it declined 
really quite sharply over that decade. And you can see there the overall expenditure. If you look in the report, uh, you can see what these categories, uh, these different colours in the bars relate to. Education spending was cut significantly. Social care spending was cut. What's available for social housing was cut. The amount spent on welfare payments was cut very significantly. And all of these areas have damaged health. Um, and the cuts weren't just average cuts, they were far steeper for more deprived areas. So the cuts were very regressive. And um, the least deprived areas you can see here um, had the lowest level of cuts um, in relation to this is adult social care spending, the dark green bar, local authority spending, the gray bar, and other service spending, so public service spending. So everywhere experienced really steep cuts. But clearly, though, the most deprived areas where the need was is greatest experienced by far the greatest cuts. So some um, very damaging and aggressive fiscal policies um, in relation to health. Um, I mentioned that wages have stagnated in this country. Um, in fact, uh, they've declined. And you can see here a comparison with uh, many of uh, the high income countries that the UK had negative wage growth over this period. Um, and you can see most of the other European countries, only Greece and Mexico um, had, had um, more negative, uh, greater wage declines over this period. So poverty is increasing in work, poverty is increasing um, in England um, over that decade. So we've seen cuts to services, which are aggressive. We've seen uh, negative wage growth, um, and here we're seeing uh, increases in children living in poverty. The dark green bar is before housing costs are taken into account, so it's increased um, since 2010. Child poverty has increased since 2010, and if you take into account housing, it's really high. A third of children in England uh, living in poverty um, after housing costs by 2017, 18, and we expect to see, unfortunately, that increasing um, since the last data that we looked at in 2017 to 18 and through the pandemic. Um, the numbers of workers in poverty increased in the UK um, for all categories, including full-time employees. Um, so really, again, large numbers of people in work who are in poverty. So the narrative about um, those who are recipients of unemployment benefit and social welfare payments, um, being in poverty really doesn't cover what we're seeing in England. It's people in work. In fact, there's more people in work in poverty in England than those out of work. Um, another figure showing the regressive nature of the policy changes between 2010 and 2020, the period of austerity, um, looking at the negative impacts of tax and welfare policies over this period. So you can see here, the most deprived on the left-hand side, the least deprived on the right-hand side, and really the changes over this period had very little effect on the wealthiest people living in the wealthiest, um, the wealthiest people. But if you go down towards the more deprived, those living in more deprived areas, uh, were lower income deciles, you can see the very, very damaging um, impacts of the policy changes. So working age people with children experience in the most deprived, of the lowest income bracket, having 15% uh, declines in income. Um, that's true also for working age people without children. Um, some declines for pensioners, but they're more protected, so lower declines for pensioners. But again, you can see that that's um, slightly regressive. Um, housing, cost of housing, a uh, significant driver of poverty in England um, for everybody, um, but particularly those in the most deprived 40-50%, um, where of course housing costs are incredibly damaging, so um, over 35% of families in 2016 to 17 were spending one third of their income on housing. And you can see the significant increases in these figures since 1996 to 97. Major driver of poverty has been these increasing 
housing costs and the impact that and lower incomes and the impact that that's had driving up these rates of poverty um, among the bottom 30 40 percent and particularly the most deprived 10 percent um, in relation to what to do about it we're often um, bombarded with literature and exhortations to improve how we eat um, and to take charge of our own um, eating habits to improve our health but you can see here the cost of eating healthily this is according to the nhs's own eat well guide um, for those who are in the most deprived decile the poorest 10 percent um, in England, they would have to spend 75% of their disposable income in order to eat well, according to this guide. So clearly impossible um, for poorer families, uh, really up until the, 40, the bottom 40%, but particularly this lowest 10%, to have any chance of eating healthily. Um, so the remedy to the inequalities in nutrition and food and the health that's associated with that. It's not just to tell people to eat more healthily, it's actually to increase income um, and to protect those people from the impacts of low income and poor low wages and low social welfare policies. Um, housing has been a significant crisis really over the preceding 10 years, the number of households in temporary accommodation, and this is associated with poverty and lack of housing supply and housing costs has increased in England and a very significant increase in the numbers of estimated numbers of people sleeping rough. Um, so sleeping outside. Um, and we know that that has was ended during the pandemic or suddenly a way they found a way to end rough sleeping, at least for a brief period. Um, it's perfectly feasible to uh, end rough sleeping in England. Um, and ideally you need to go back and address the causes of why people are rough sleeping, why people are homeless, associated with poverty, substance misuse, uh, coming out of the armed forces, being in prison, uh, various factors very clearly associated with risk of homelessness um, and rough sleeping in particular. Um, and these need to be um, addressed before people end up on the having to sleep on the streets. Um, well, I haven't got many of the figures, they're all in the report from 2010 about uh, places and about communities. I've touched on housing, but costs of public transport uh, increased significantly over this period. This is one showing um, inequalities in exposure to poor quality air. Uh, PM10 concentrations were much higher um, among the more deprived 20% than the least 20% according to this and obviously there's more data and then information in the main report around the, um, the conditions in which people are living, the communities, the health of the high streets, the shops people have access to, the services people have access to, the community functioning really, community resilience, which as I says, has been significantly undermined by the funding cuts that were we saw over this period. So that's a very brief run through um, the assessment that we did of what had happened in, in the um, preceding 10 years from 2010 to 2020, before the pandemic arrived. Uh, a really bleak picture. Um, there was a lot of press and media interest in the report and in the analysis when we published it. Um, and we came to the conclusion that austerity had damaged health significantly um, in England and that the policies implemented by the government um, had really undermined health and well-being across the country and in very unequal ways. So we saw health inequalities widening. We've seen these regional inequalities widening. Health across the board has been damaged. Um, and that was the position that we came into the pandemic with. So weakened public services, weakened local authority spending, big cuts to public health, uh, poor health um, in England and deteriorating health. So we weren't in a, a strong position at all uh, when the pandemic ha ha arrived. And that's not even accounting for the government's response or preparations for the pandemic, which as we know um, have been sort of significantly weaker than they should have been and we were on the back foot from the start. Um, 
so in about we published the report and then almost immediately um it was in 2020 we had a launch event in person in london in march 2020 and then everybody went retreated to their homes and we had lockdown so following on from that we felt it was really important to update what had happened um, in england through the pandemic in relation to inequalities in exposure to COVID-19, infection, inequalities in mortality, and really importantly, the long-term damage to the social determinants of health as a result of um, the restrictions, the lockdown measures, the, the economic damage, rates of unemployment, inequalities in education um, that were happening throughout the whole of 2020 and into 2021, may still continue, yet to be decided, um, that we're going to likely to damage health in the long term. Now, I don't want to paint a completely desperate picture, although overall the position is very concerning here, and particularly in low middle income countries across the world. So we've also at the same time as doing this work in England, as I mentioned, we were reviewing what was happening in the Middle East and North Africa, where the rates of infection from the pandemic haven't been as high as they have been, at least not reported as high, and certainly the mortality has been a lot lower than it has in, uh, in Europe and North America and Brazil. But the impacts from the containment measures have been really, really serious. Um, so in relation to those on um, in informal work who have to continue working, therefore exposed to the pandemic, rates of poverty, uh, food production, food distribution systems, um, the, lack, the availability of resources for national government to distribute, I mean, really significant damaging impacts, which will continue for a long time. So even once the infection um, rates from COVID and the immortality rates decline globally, the impacts will be felt of course, for a long time and we really need to start preparations now. So although I'm um, referring to what's happened globally, um, the report that we did and published in December 2020, um, refers only to England, but um, we've been working with WHO and we'll shortly be publishing a, a review with them about what's happened globally. Um, and that work will continue. There's a big social determinants of health um, push from WHO, which is very good to see. Um, and they are considering these issues for lower uh, and middle income countries in particular, and what the responses of government um, should be in terms of protecting those who are most vulnerable to, the Ill, to ill health as a result of the containment measures. So this report, as I said, published in December 2020, um, shows very clearly that COVID mortality follows a very similar gradient to all cause mortality. So it follows a very similar social class gradient to um, deaths and risk of mortality um, overall. Um, COVID-19 in the pale green, that's mortality from COVID-19 by um, index of multiple deprivation decile. For those who aren't aware what this is, this is a, an index of, in England of how deprived an area, fairly smaller area is. So the most deprived 10% of areas measured by the IMD, which is a covers health, um, income, various measures of deprivation. Um, so it's a very useful measure for looking at inequalities in health. And you can see all cause mortality and COVID-19 mortality over this period. Um, and although it doesn't quite look it, the actual steepness of this gradient is very similar to all cause mortality um, for men. Um, and here for women, it's slightly less steep, but still you can see very clearly this social class gradient in COVID-19 mortality. So as is now uh, very apparent and I think very well known, uh, COVID-19 mortality is highly unequal related to social economic position and very similar in that regard to mortality from all other causes. Again, we see these large inequal regional inequalities um, in COVID-19 mortality. Um, um, Southwest and Southeast um, having the lowest 
excess deaths from uh, COVID-19 in the northwest, northeast Yorkshire and the Humber, the highest. Um, and in London, um, a sort of middle picture has actually increased. This was before the, the, the second wave. So we've seen some changes in this. I think the northeast and London have increased significantly um, through December to March um, this year. Um, and again, this is now sli slightly outdated, um, well, very outdated. In fact, it's a, a year old, this analysis, but it shows very clearly how badly England was performing in relation to COVID, um, all-cause mortality over the period uh, January to June, by far the highest excess mortality for men um, and for women of all these other comparable European countries. So very significant uh, mortality in England, but that's now a, a familiar a site, and I think that's still the case largely uh, Europe, uh, in, among European countries that England has the highest all-cause mortality. I may be slightly outdated on that, but I think that's still the case. Um, so we assessed why England's pandemic toll was so high. Um, clearly the governance and political culture is really important. The, our response, the government's response to the pandemic initially, the late lockdowns, um, the on the back foot responses, the lack of preparedness in terms of um, PPE, um, protections for people um, combined with the late lockdowns, very significant, and the lack of trust in a way in what the government was saying. I mean, it changes its mind every day. Um, nobody's quite sure what the rules are. All those kind of issues that we've seen highlighted over the year um, have probably taken a toll. Um, these widening inequities in power, money, and resources, basically the ones that we've reported on in 20, we and others have reported on in 2020, uh, we've seen these very, very stark and increasing inequalities between individuals, communities, and regions. Um, and those led to those inequalities, really, that we saw um, in relation to COVID-19 uh, mortality um, and socioeconomic position. Government policies of austerity which I've just uh, very briefly overviewed, meant that many places were in a terrible shape really to take the necessary steps um, and people were in a desperate position in poverty. They couldn't stay at home, not work. They couldn't self-isolate um, when required to do so because um, they didn't have enough savings and income high levels of poverty. So for all these reasons, reasons the kind of policies of austerity um, led to this damaging health and the state of public services, I think, is another important issue, uh, the, the how far public health had been cut um, and the, the uh, level of funding for the NHS as well. Um, and as we've talked about, health had stopped improving and there was a high prevalence of poor health, which we know is very closely associated with, um, with COVID-19 mortality. So England was in an unhealthy shape um, before the pandemic, which obviously contributed to high levels of mortality. And just to add, and I should have added this before, the austerity also significantly damaged social care, um, at least in the first wave. That was a significant, the uh, social deaths in care homes was a significant contributor to overall mortality in England. Um, so, Factors leading to these high levels of um, mortality in more deprived areas, clearly overcrowded household is, uh, was and remains a very significant contributor to the spread of the disease and to mortality from the disease. And you can see here very clearly the association between the rate of deaths involving COVID um, and the percent of overcrowded households by local authority. So new and high levels of overcrowding, high rates of COVID mortality, um, and you can see there is a close association. Um, we could produce similar graphs showing um, those working in key sectors, people who have to use public transport rather than their own car to get to work and so on. Um, and while we were make, doing this work, we were also reviewing the deaths of London bus drivers um, in the first wave of the pandemic. So there was a high rate of mortality among London bus drivers during the early stages of the pandemic. And again, 
to some extent that was related to their job clearly but also to the conditions in which they were living um, in very deprived overcrowded housing often um, and you can see here the very close association between COVID-19 mortality and occupation. Um, this is for women. The inequalities for men um, are much starker. But for those working, this, the average for England here on the, is the dotted line. So that's average mortality at this point per 100,000. And you can see the professions, um, sales and customer service occupations, elementary occupations, um, process plant machine operatives, caring leisure and other service occupations much higher. These tend to be um, lower income, lower status occupations and professional technical occupations, much lower mortality, managers, directors and senior officials, people who could work from home and do their jobs at home clearly had much lower rates of mortality than average for England. Um, drilling down into which specific Professions, you can see taxi drivers and chauffeurs, this is at this point, um, had high rates of mortality uh, from COVID. And you can see the very close association with uh, minority ethnic groups here. So those occupations which had high percent of the workforce as a minority ethnic also had high rates of deaths involving COVID. So far more exposed clearly to um, the pandemic, to infection, um, and also unhealthy jobs, living in unhealthy conditions, um, poverty, high rates of poverty, and that's closely associated with ethnicity as well. Um, this is again showing the high rates of um, mortality rates for social care and healthcare workers compared to the English average. This is for men this time, and you can see social care workers with very high rates. Um, so we know clearly, and there's been much more evidence since we published in December 2020, about the high rates of uh, COVID mortality among uh, ethnic groups. Um, and the reasons for that um, are to do with occupation, living conditions, poverty, and of course, um, behind all that sits structural racism and discrimination. So people of minority ethnic groups are more likely to be living in poverty, um, in low status occupations, key worker occupations, um, because of racism and discrimination over many decades. So that's one reason. Secondly, accounts of actual discrimination in terms of access to PPE um, and various accounts from the health service about uh, people being put into more frontline, minority ethnic groups being put into more frontline occupations and not well protected. So there's still a lot to learn from the pandemic um, about all this. And I think more information will emerge about explaining some of these ethnic inequalities in exposure, mortality, and of course it relates to poor health going in into the pandemic, which is much higher among some, not all, but some uh, minority ethnic groups, uh, middle-aged men in particular, you can see those inequalities quite clearly. Um, and mortality rates much higher among more deprived communities and that goes on. I mean, we talk now about COVID-19 becoming a disease of poverty, um, like most diseases. When the pandemic first arrived, we were surprised that, you know, Prince Charles was infected, the Prime Minister, it was all the top echelons of people who'd been travelling in February, skiing holidays, international travel and so on, were really um, among the first to contract the disease. But which was surprising to us. We were looking at this thinking this is a very unusual disease pattern to see. Um, but very quickly it became um, a disease much more associated with deprivation and poverty. And that's really becoming very entrenched now, I think. Um, and as we go through uh, the next stage of the pandemic, I expect we see those inequalities even more clearly emerging. And the pandemic will remain in poorer communities at fairly high rates for a much longer time. So, so very clear inequalities, of course, in mortality and infection from COVID-19. We don't yet know about non-COVID um, and the socioeconomic um, inequalities in non-COVID, but that research will no doubt come um, and we'll see what, what that shows, but it may well be that it shows, like most diseases, uh, social class position, social class inequalities. I'm looking at the impacts of containment measures. Um, as I've mentioned, these very 
very clearly have socioeconomic inequality impacts um, and will affect health for a long time. You see these inequalities in the social determinants of health increasing rapidly, and you know that very shortly um, there will be impacts on health. In fact, we've already seen this in relation to mental health very clearly, um, and it increases in unhealthy health behaviours, um, and we know that that will translate into widening inequalities in health. So um, education, of course, a major um, um, association, uh, educational attainment very closely associated with health position um, in later life. And you can see inequalities in education have a very clear social class dimension, which was made worse through the pandemic. So the most deprived kids really have, having a greater loss of learning here that's very, very marked. And you can see for the least deprived, also struggling with um, loss of learning. Um, but two months behind, three months behind, um, whereas for more deprived kids, that's three, four, five, six months behind. So these inequalities in education and attainment, which we've seen as very persistent in England, as in most countries, have widened through the pandemic, very concerning for health. Uh, food insecurity clearly increased, and this was early days of the pandemic, but we expect to see food insecurity increasing as poverty rates increase. Um, immediate impacts on mental health, it's talked about the impacts of social isolation and um, during lockdowns. Um, and I think that just the general context in which people are uh, coming into adulthood, um, anxiety and depression rates have really increased. And you can see here, this is from young women, um, 16 to 34, much higher rates um, of unhappiness and depression. Uh, throughout both COVID waves and uh, 60, it's increased for everybody, but much less for the 65 years and over. Um, so this is for men um, and this is for women. So you can see the uh, women with much higher rates, but also young men rapidly increasing. Um, the youngest age group had the highest rates of unemployment. And I think longer term damage to their prospects for employment and educational attainment. Um, so of course this age group has suffered least with mortality and ill health, really struggling with the impacts of the containment measures, um, not just in terms of what's happened immediately during lockdowns and social isolations, but the prospects, longer term prospects, so unemployment, educational inequalities and so on. And you can see here 16 to 24 year olds, very high rates of unemployment, very high increases in the unemployment rates. Um, impacts on wages. Um, again, you can see these regional inequalities um, and the enormous increases actually since 2010, 2010 um, in the percent below the, national, below the national minimum wage. So um, increasing up to eight, nine percent, uh, nearly 10 percent in the northeast um, from one or two percent in 2010. And that's a combination of those who are not furloughed and those who are furloughed. So just to go back to that, the not furloughed, I think very significant increases since 2010 anyway, and then you add in the 80% of wages that people received when they were furloughed, uh, which pushed many more people into poverty. You can see the impacts here of um, the increases in low wages. Um, unemployment rates increased and um, expect to see um, some people unable to get work, even when it becomes available, unemployment, uh, there's, there's employment available. For those people who've been unemployed, it's particularly hard to get back into the labour market. And for young people, who have missed out a big chunk. And you can see these regional inequalities as well. Um, so big increases in unemployment in all regions, uh, highest rates in North East and London. Um, these will change as the uh, lockdown ends but expect to see longer term impacts from those people who've experienced unemployment and in some sectors, continuing unemployment. Um, the Joseph Roundtree Foundation um, analyzed where they expected areas to struggle to recover the most. Um, and those who are hardest hit here in the darker colors, and you can see the Northwest and Northeast um, coastal towns and cities around England, are likely to really struggle 
to recover from the pandemic, um, according to this analysis. This is in relation to employment, but also um, in terms of kind of financing for local authorities and what's available for them. Um, in response, as I said, we, we had this analysis about why we did so badly in our remedy, really. We have a whole lot of recommendations about how to reduce these inequalities um, in the social determinants of health um, as a result of the, both the situation pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. And essentially this requires, there's a whole set of recommendations we make, but this requires for health and well-being and equity to be at the heart of government policy. And I think that's absolutely vital um, that we really focus on how to get health and equity at the heart of decisions about government. It's something we've all been, those, those of us working in social determinants of health, have been calling for for a long, long time. We've not seen it. Um, in fact, we've gone the other way where health and equity have been damaged. We need to restore the prominence and priority given to health and to equity. And I think there are opportunities to do this. As I've said, silver linings from the pandemic have been that these issues are widely recognised and much more widely recognised. Um, health is the number one priority for most people and that equity is vital if we're to succeed and to recover and that inequalities are driving inequalities in health. And these particularly the last point, but all of those haven't been well recognised or acknowledged at least politically and among the public. So I think there is an opportunity now to really push on this. We need a national strategy on inequalities. We haven't had one since 2010, unbelievably. Um, and we need the cross-government action. We need all sectors to work together in this kind of societal endeavour to reduce inequalities and improve health. Um, we need this clumsy phrase, proportionate universalism. We need policies and resources to be universal, but proportionate to need. So to match those gradients, those inequalities that we see, we need funding to be progressive, not regressive, in the way that we have over the last 10 years. So we need to invest far more in those people, communities, regions, which are have the highest levels of need, have the highest worst health, and have been cut the most over the previous 10 years. Um, the government is talking a lot about levelling up between regions, um, largely because, um, I think cynically, because uh, they know where the votes lie at the moment. But uh, these regional inequalities are very, very damaging to the whole um, national uh, health and economic functioning, really, of the country um, and blight the lives of many, many people uh, particularly those who are more deprived um, in various regions in England. So we need to level up. Um, we need to, so we reviewed all of these areas again, updated all the recommendations that we made in the 2010 report. There's a lot of them, and they're highly relevant to the government. So when the government says, oh, we can't do this, we don't know what to do, there isn't enough evidence. That's uh, not true. There's plenty of evidence from us and from a whole range of other stakeholders and people about what needs to happen, how to do it, what that would cost, what that would entail. So the, the objections to this um, approach are not technical. They're political, social, um, but they're certainly not technical. We know what to do now. Um, I won't go through all of these, but there's a whole set of recommendations. So that's a very brief overview, well, it's quite a long overview, but it's brief in terms of what the material covers um, of um, work that we did just before and during the pandemic and our assessment of the position we're in and what needs to happen next. Um, and as I've said, there's been a lot of interest locally and that's really escalated as a result of the pandemic. So anecdotally, I guess, we are being contacted all the time by places saying, what can we do? We want to do this kind of approach that you are outlining and that Michael Marmot is advocating um, and leading. How do we become a Marmot place? How do we embed these kind of principles locally? It's really um, important. So local authorities are contacting us. The healthcare sector has been an enormous upsurge in interest um, partly because of developments within the health system in England in terms of the um, integrated care systems which are coming, which have prevention at their heart. But I think a general recognition that you can't just keep treating people um, 
you need to improve health in the population um, in order to reduce demand on the NHS and in order to improve health. So really we wider, greater, far greater recognition among healthcare actors in many places that um, it's about social and economic factors as much as about getting uh, people treatment when they need it. Um, we've also been contacted by businesses, and this is really the first time this has happened to us. So far greater interest and I think appetite to try and do something, recognising that businesses have a social um, as well as economic role in the country. They're not just there to make a profit or provide services. They're, they have employees, they have impacts on the places in which they work, they invest assets and the sustainable development movement has shown us how important it is um, about where these assets um, are invested and the changes that can occur if those investments are shifted, for example, away from fossil fuels, but looking at healthy investments, investments that support um, more deprived places that um, really shift away from um, high maximising profit to maximising social impact. That may be a slightly optimistic view of what's happening, but certainly from our perspective, there's a lot more focus and appetite to really, for businesses to scrutinise their own role in all of this and to try and do something. So we want to capitalise on this moment where there is this upset. We know it won't last, but we need to kind of take make the most of this opportunity while the focus is on health and on equity and on the social role um, of business and of healthcare organisations and so on. Um, I've been talking for quite a long time now. Um, there may well be questions, I'm not sure. I'm going to talk a bit more um, about the work that we did in Greater Manchester, which was really to try and make the recommendations that we've been making nationally specific to a local place, even if it's a big um, local place, um, well, region really. So this is where we're having to get practical um, and focus on the levers that are in, in a place, the kind of context of the place, which is very small geographies and very small differences within places, uh, which are really important that we try and tackle those at a very local level, and as well as making big national um, and international recommendations. Um, I'll pause for a moment. There may be questions and people may want to have a, a break. Um, I'm going to get a drink or a uh, comfort break. Um, I don't know if there's any questions. I think, Greg, you've been monitoring. Oh, loads of questions. Yeah, Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Oh, on, sorry. Um, loads of questions, Jessica. Do you okay. need a quick break? Um, no, but do you think we should have one just for a couple of minutes to allow everybody to go? We still yeah. 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 Shall we? Um, shall we? Uh, come minutes, back so. Literally two minutes. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. So Jessica, thanks so much for that um, start of uh, 10. Uh, so many questions and wondered if you could give us a bit more information on some of the um, some of the actions and activities, both from the first Marmot report, uh, the second one, and what we can do in terms of influencing policymakers, mm -hmm. as well as um, how we're disseminating uh, the information to the public, and how we build that body of um, advocacy across our um, nations uh, to really think through uh, all of the important findings that you have in these reports? Mm. So, I, th I mean, it's, it's shifted since the 2010 Marmot Review. At the 2010 Marmot Review, as I said, we, we did a report commissioned by government, we reported into government, they accepted it, the public health white paper at the time, you know, it's fairly standard government response and government report um, and we were fairly optimistic there was some legislation around health inequalities that was embedded but it quickly became apparent that you know most of the austerity policies and so on were running directly counter to what we were recommending um, and that government interest was polite but fairly weak um, in reality um, and we had 
interest from the NHS, but again, the kind of healthcare discourse clearly, I mean, it's absolutely essential. It's vitally important that the NHS provides the services it provides, but the opportunity to kind of really embed more prevention and tackling health inequalities was, was there, but it was fairly um, small. Um, and over the 10 years, as I said, the main interest came from local authorities. So Coventry established itself as a Marmot city in 2013 and has done some great work. We've got a report on what they've done if people are interested on our website, Coventry Evaluation. They set up mechanisms locally, they developed a whole approach, they call themselves a Marmot city and they continue to have a, a group um, with monitoring system sitting behind it, delivery targets, comes from a wide range of sectors. So they're really doing that cross-sector proportionate approach that we've been advocating for a long time within Coventry. So that's been really interesting. Other places also took up the mantle and at one point, I think, health and wellbeing boards, which are in every local authority in England, I think 75% of them were taking a Marmot approach. But we, we hadn't, and we continue not to have that sort of national focus that we need. And as I said, I think this is, I mean, it's partly political um, at least, but I think there's an openness in a way, or an opportunity, not necessarily an openness, an opportunity to really push on this now. Um, and MPs are important in this, particularly those MPs who represent um, local authorities in the North and Northeast, those areas with um, much worse health. And certainly we've been trying to talk to MPs from all parties um, to set out what's happening in their area in relation to health, not just in relation to COVID, but in relation to health inequalities anyway, and how they can really push the government to do far more to remedy this. And there is this uh, narrative, at least, on uh, levelling up. And levelling up means levelling up between regions, clearly, which I think is where the government's focus is, but also levelling up within places. So every local authority has intense areas of deprivation, I think, almost every, uh, where they need to level up within the local authority as well. So I think the political push is really important. There's local councillors, there's MPs, and for people to work very closely with them and provide the information and suggest ways in which they can influence government policy um, and there's various mechanisms within the parliamentary system and so on um, to do that. So that's one, one way. Um, and the second way really is um, the, for medical leaders, so health doctors, nurses, those people with positions of authority, people in public health to really advocate so strongly about this. I mean, Medical staff still remain, I think, the most trusted group um, of professionals in England. Politicians are about the least. So when they start talking about issues and advocating very clearly, you do get changes, you do get shifts, you get that public awareness. Um, you know, doctors advocating in their local area for to retain green spaces, to reduce air pollution. That's powerful stuff. It doesn't have to all come from the local authority. So we really want to harness the energy. Um, and reputation of the healthcare sector to do this. And I think um, we've seen some of that from NHS England, from the leadership, but we can see far more, notwithstanding all the pressures that they have to deal with um, around treating patients and the backlog, which is gonna dominate for a while, uh, for a long time, um, following the pandemic, but still huge opportunities to really take this agenda far further and also to recognize that their patients arrive with their ill health related to the conditions in which they are living and working and what they can do in their interactions with patients to support them, you know, refer them to financial support services or housing services to get better health. So we've also written reports on what doctors and the healthcare sector can do um, to improve the health of their populations, their local populations and at national level. Um, and as I've said, businesses, there is, there is an interest you know, there is more of an interest than normal. So again, I push on those people who have very close links with employers, with businesses, the local economic partnerships in England are very, very important, the chambers of commerce, all the different ways that employers um, get together and meet. We haven't really had a massive voice 
uh, we as public health haven't really had an important voice at those tables. We've been slightly shouting from the sidelines. I think there's an opportunity to be absolutely central to those. Um, and as I've said, to support local authorities generally in this agenda, I think. Um, so there are opportunities um, and it's not straightforward. It's never straightforward, but as I said, we don't want to miss this, this particular moment where it's also evident and apparent and everybody's prepared to have societal change and prepared to prioritise health and I think equity. Thank you. I think you're so right that if this isn't our latest clarion call to get things done, then I don't know what is. And you've certainly been able to give us the evidence base to support it. My apologies, we seem to be building a, a new building in my back garden. Um, but I, I just wanted to bring in another set of conversations that have been have uh, that's been uh, going on in the chat. Um, because from the beginning, you've always said the importance of the first thousand days mm. and the um, the crux of um, what we should be concentrating on. And I think um, Sir Michael's always said that that would be his priority if you had to ask him to prioritise all the recommendations. Uh, so in the chat, there's been a lot of um, comments on education. And I think the work that you presented on how much further behind our children are um, from the most deprived communities is just quite frightening. Just wondered if you had any thoughts on um, how we um, bridge that gap and also the ability to talk to not just health select committees, but also the education committees so that we don't see that cohort effect that's likely to happen where those people that have suffered the most as they go through um, their life stages, we just widen the inequalities further. Mm. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, so there is good evidence on how to tackle inequalities in attainment. In fact, Greater Manchester's done, so, and Coventry, have both focused on early years and seen decreases in the inequalities in readiness for school, the measure of um, how many children are at five to begin school. So they've been successful. This was prior to the pandemic. Um, and so there is good evidence about what to do. It does require investment. It does require people working closely with parents in more deprived communities to support them. Um, and, you know, the first 1,000 years really involves the health of, well, the mother in particular, but also the family and the family context. So you need to support whole families. Um, and Greater Manchester have their Thrive uh, or I Thrive project, which tries to do exactly that. Nothing's at sufficient scale really to tackle the challenges, um, but there is good evidence about what to do, how to do it. Now we just need the scale and investment. And again, this is a, a question of resources, but even without the resources, as in Coventry, Greater Manchester, you can make improvements. So um, we can't just sit around waiting for government to invest more in it because we may be waiting, we've got to take action now. And there are building those links, supporting early years providers, uh, public health coming in and supporting uh, mental health etc I think there's there's good ways to show how important this cross sector working is and for young people I mean that was our priority actually in the greater Manchester work because of the damage through the pandemic has been so acute on younger people I'm not just talking about the first thousand years here it's right up 18 19 to 18 19 year olds so mental health support is absolutely central building resilience so schools really working not just for educational attainment but to build kids resilience life skills liaising with employers much greater focus on training and apprenticeships which again have been damaged through the pandemic but they really are and i think while we've got this maybe fleeting interest from business but while we have it what are they doing to support more deprived young people in relation to they're very hard to get those apprenticeships you know and there's very few we could really expand that um, and you know all the evidence shows that they're great for the employers great for the trainees and the those on apprenticeships um, probably need better pay 
um, in order to reduce inequalities in who's getting them. But I think, you know, there, there are opportunities to work even without the government focus and even without those big national levers to work with those sectors which are interested and can affect change um, outside of government. Brilliant. And that's a great segue into the second part of the session. Yeah. Um, um, and um, just to remind delegates to post their questions in the chat, please. And the partner where um, we've got 14 minutes, so I'll try and keep it brief and then we can pick up any questions. We finish at 11. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. OK, Thank so um, we were working with Greater Manchester before um, the pandemic, um, but we they became a Marmot City region. Um, uh, Andy Burnham was actually um, uh, Secretary of State um, when briefly when we were working on the Marmot um, review we knew him and he was very keen on the work um, the health and social care partnership there uh, commissioned us to work with them to establish themselves as Marmot City region in recognition of the widespread inequalities in health within the Mar uh, within the uh, Greater Manchester region um, <clears throat> and to tackle them and of course they've got with the devolved powers um, and the mayor, they've got levers which aren't available to other areas and that very clear focus on cross-sector partnerships or cross-sector working among public services, but generally um, this place-based approach um, with all the sectors working together in theory on the priorities. So they were in a good position. They had already met lots of the things which we're asking for, for this approach in social determinants of health. Um, so it was an exciting commission, really, for us to work very closely alongside them. Um, and once the pandemic hit, they wanted to understand the inequalities in relation to um, infection and mortality in their region, but also these impacts from containment measures um, and what could be done about them, importantly. So we, we called the report Build Back Fairer in Greater Manchester. And Build Back Fairer, of course, um, relates to the fact that some unequal going into the pandemic and becoming more unequal. And what we need to do is not just build back better, but build back fairer. And we know who the winners, I guess, if anyone's a winner, but there have been winners through the pandemic um, and a lot of losers, more um, less high income communities, more deprived areas and regions. So we need to build back fairer. And it's a moral, it's a moral imperative. It's not just um, an economic, um, imperative it's a moral imperative and we have practical ways now to think about leveling up so as i mentioned equity of health will be at the heart of policy and that's really what we looked at for greater manchester as i said manchester has very strong partnerships that's absolutely central to social determinants of health they have an inspiring vision for the future and a very good leadership set up to take this on um, and i think you know, there's a, there's a great appetite to do these kind of things in Greater Manchester. They lack resources, they need more investment from national government, but even without that, they've been doing um, lots of very practical um, and important efforts in the context of austerity, which has been a significant achievement. So we developed this framework for Greater Manchester, the Build Back Fairer framework, which covered all the key social determinants about that we talk about early years, housing, communities and places, public health, work and employment, and then these mechanisms. So in each of these areas, we make recommendations, but we have additional recommendations for building back fairer. We talk about the importance of young people for future generations, standards. Um, so standards of housing, employment, air quality. These are additional to the kind of basic public service standards, which are, uh, public services have to work towards. These build on those. So there's the, recommendation of a network of framework of standards for different services um, and different conditions in living and working and housing. Um, institutions, I've talked about the importance of healthcare institutions, universities, other big anchor institutions who can really make a difference to the places and employees that they work with and the places they're working in. But also we have a strong focus on business in this report. Um, monitoring accountability, we established a set of beacon indicators, um, which Greater Manchester, we hope, are going to take forward to monitor inequalities in health and to look at the impacts of policies. So we'll be able to evaluate the impacts of policies as well. 
and then extending devolution. Um, clearly, there are many levers which the mayor and the whole uh, devolu devolved uh, system doesn't have and needs really in order to make the changes that they've identified as vital to reducing inequalities and resources absolutely central. And partly that's advocacy towards national government and pushing politically. Um, you know, there's 10, 10 local authorities in Greater Manchester with lots of MPs, the mayor, you know, to really advocate for the for this leveling up agenda that that requires greater resources. But also within Greater Manchester to make sure that the resources that are available are allocated in a proportionate but universal way. So responding to need very, very clearly um, and supporting those more deprived areas. Um, going into the pandemic, Greater Manchester had lower life expectancy than the average um, for England. So this is the average dotted line for England for men and only Trafford and Stockport have slightly higher life expectancy than the average for England. You can see all those other local authorities um, with lower um, life expectancy, the average for Greater Manchester here. Um, similarly for females, um, Trafford and Stockport have higher than the average for England everywhere else is lower. Great, the Manchester City Council, uh, much lower life expectancy for both females and for males. So, Poor health going in um, and COVID mortality has been much higher in Greater Manchester than the average for England. So the dark green dots here are the average for England and you can see all the local authority um, within Greater Manchester with higher COVID-19 mortality than for England. Similarly for females, only Trafford has higher um, for men, only, sorry, only for men, Trafford has um, lower life expectancy than the average, for, sorry, COVID mortality than the average for England and Stockport female. And you can see again this gradient um, in COVID-19 mortality um, among areas. This is the IMD decile, the most deprived, the least deprived. And you can see the England and Wales baseline is here at one. So that's the average for England. Um, and you can see that among the more deprived communities, COVID-19 mortality is much higher, much higher than the average for England. Um, and this is the average for Greater Manchester, the mortality. So it's, I think, 25% higher than England overall. But you can see these inequalities. It's actually lower um, among the least deprived areas. So you can see, again, how much higher COVID mortality was in Greater Manchester and how unequal that was even within Greater Manchester. So high overall and unequal. Um, the impact has been very damaging. We've only got the figures, these are provisional figures um, for the Northwest. The life expectancy declines. I mean, these are astonishing declines in life expectancy. You never see this, even through wars, you don't see life expectancy declines on this scale um, in a year. Um, for the Northwest, for women, decline of 1.2 years, for men, 1.6 years. Um, and they've declined across England, it's higher in the Northwest. Um, but really staggering declines in life expectancy as a result of COVID mortality. And this is an astonishing thing to contemplate, really, um, and will take a long time to repair. And as I said, we need to make sure that those communities with the lowest life expectancy have experienced the greatest decline through the COVID pandemic, um, the ones which receive the greatest investment in resources um, and focus going forward. Um, we looked at the impacts as we did across England, but we looked at the impacts of containment at the uh, sort of conditions going into the pandemic. And you can see again, the poverty rate, uh, rates of child poverty before and after housing, costs in Greater Manchester are all very high. Um, this relates to the amount of schooling missed by the student in Greater Manchester. And we've already pointed out that the, the loss of schooling has been very unequal across England. Um, and across Greater Manchester, even higher than the English average. This is for um, secondary school, the amount of um, days missed per student. You can see in Rochdale, Oldham, Bolton, Wigan, really 
really large numbers of days lost, much higher than the English average. Um, and similarly for primary school, um, much higher. There's only a couple of local authorities um, which have lower than the English average there for primary. So very concerning for Greater Manchester and they're struggling. This is partly a result of the disease pattern in Greater Manchester, which didn't align well with the lockdowns in England. The, the, the pandemic arrived later, just as we were opening up um, across England. They then had a series of local lockdowns, in addition to the national lockdowns, which were further damaging, there were just very high rates of infection um, circulating, which partly explains all this absence um, among secondary school kids. Um, mental health has suffered, so you can see that there's increases in parents who are worried about their children's mental health. Um, and I mean, we're starting here looking at November 2020. Um, these are from some surveys that they did, but um, this goes back to clearly to March 2020. You will see increases in all that period, but it's getting worse over time. Um, obviously, I guess children's mental health is deteriorating the longer the pandemic and lockdowns go on. Um, high rates of uh, low pay in Greater Manchester. Uh, there's a Great Britain average, and you can see that every local authority has higher rates. So significant challenges in Greater Manchester, which will have been made worse by the pandemic. Um, percentage of people who've been financially impacted by the pandemic. And you can see again that mostly these impacts are cumulative. They're worse in February than they were even in November. But people are working reduced hours, losing their jobs, 20%, uh, not just being furloughed, but losing their jobs, requiring support, food bank use has gone up, um, and um, all these financial impacts accumulating from the pandemic. We know that going into the pandemic, um, public health spending had been cut, um, the English average per head reduction um, was about. Uh, 13, 14 pounds per head had been cut from the public health budget, uh, much higher for the northeast, west Midlands, London, east Midlands, and northwest, all those areas with worse health who require actually more resources, not less, um, in terms of public health spending and spending generally. Um, but you can see that they received uh, far higher rates of cuts. Um, the latest um, public health funding allocations have slightly increased, but nothing to compensate the cuts of experience and compared to the uh, what public health uh, services need to do now um, through the pandemic and in the aftermath, um, the, the funding received is woefully inadequate. Um, so we made these recommendations, as I pointed out, we had these kind of mechanisms for making the changes that we want to see in um, the social determinants of health in Greater Manchester, um, all sitting around the underpinned by these indicators. So we make a lot of recommendations in each of these sectors. There's loads of examples of good practice from Greater Manchester and from other areas that are worth a look because Greater Manchester has a lot in place. Um, the scale, as I said, um, and the intensity and the attuning to the need and deprivation needs to be continually expanded um there is much in place and there's a lot of strategies which we hope will be effective um, to support better employment there's a good employment charter there's the housing standards that they're trying to implement um, there's just been some important initiatives around public transport and access to public improving access and reducing cost of public transport so there are things happening um, which are really important we want to build on those um, and really focus in on building back fairer in Greater Manchester is some of the ways, and there's many more than this that we point out in the report, but there's um, some of the ways that we think this can be done in Greater Manchester, um, leveraging the interest um, and appetite to do this from employers to pay a decent living wage um, in Greater Manchester to ensure good quality work, to really support uh, employees in their living conditions, um, as well as in their employment conditions to support those local communities. And I think um, business, healthcare, other big institutions in Manchester, there is an appetite to do this that we can extend using social value contracting, which is a specific obligation actually on contractors to think about the social value 
impacts of their money that they're spending, to think about their supply chain, to think about their procurement, to really extend that economic role um, into a social role, um, extend, really push on these equity targets for Greater Manchester to make sure that the required action um, is aligned to greater equity um, and to force the sort of leadership and all those people to focus um, to focus on equity as well as on averages. So lots of ways in which this, this can be taken forward. These are the indicators that we developed um, sitting underneath each of these indicators. There's a lot of detail about the kind of data that can be used, how it can be disaggregated and so on. And um, as I said, we hope that Greater Manchester will take this forward really to provide that basis um, for measuring and monitoring and galvanizing action. Um, and overall, there's an appetite thinking Greater Manchester, which is really important. It's half, well, it's not half the battle, but it's part of the battle, is around this advocacy. Um, and the leadership is aligned and do want to ensure greater equity in Greater Manchester and to build back fairer and to really push nationally to do this. So some unique circumstances in Greater Manchester in relation to the conditions, the socioeconomic and health conditions they have, but also in relation to their own agendas and how they can take these forward um, to respond fairly in the aftermath of the pandemic and of the containment measures which have been damaging. I'll leave it there um, and take any questions if we have time. Thank you so much, Jessica. That's just been a phenomenal um, set of um, slides that really pave the way and your friends up here in Greater Manchester will ensure that we can um, carry on the conversation. Um, I think um, just to point delegates to the fabulous resource uh, that's on the IHE website. And um, I wondered if we could, Jessica, um, ensure that uh, we have a follow-up meeting with you very soon. Uh, so that we can think uh, through some of the, the challenges that are in the report for Greater Manchester. Uh, think about your, um, um, your recommendations, both locally and nationally. And then for our international delegates, I think there's so much that we can learn from each other, as you said right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we hope that this is the beginning of another um, journey uh, with IHE and yourself especially, so that we can ensure all those conversations from when the Marmot Report was published 11 years ago onto all the fabulous work you've been doing since then. Mm -hmm. We can actually bring some of those things into fruition. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you and also to um, invite you back uh, virtually or in person to Greater Manchester so that we can think through all of the thought provoking details that you've so eloquently demonstrated. Thank you, Paula. My absolute pleasure. And I look forward to future conversations with you and other people who I haven't been able to respond to, but they can contact us through the Institute or various other ways and we'll try and respond. So, sorry, I talked a long time, but there's a lot to say. So, absolutely. I think um, from all the chat and the questions, we could listen to you for another few hours. So, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank I'd like to thank the um, delegates uh, for a fantastic session and um, please have a look at our programme. We now have our daily digest um, at the bottom of the programme and um, I'm just going to ask Greg um, if uh, there are any other messages for delegates. None from today, no, just a... Uh... Keep checking through the program and join all of the sessions throughout the week as many as you can. We've got loads on throughout the week and uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us all the way through and 
see all the way to the prizes at the very end of the last session on uh, session five. And remember to keep voting for the oral and uh, poster sessions. Brilliant. Thank you, Greg. So our hashtag is PHFest2021, and we hope to see you at the next session. Thank you, everyone.